Um, trying to think of anything interesting. There's this uh, loop. Uh, it's supposed to be a new open source uh, 3D modeler for geology. It's a group from France with uh, sponsors from Australia. Uh, loop. Yeah, loop. So you can look at that. But it's really at the beginning. They're still looking for programmers. So uh, um, it's the same people that started the GoCAD back in the days. Oh, really? And now they're kind of good, I guess, doing like us. They're <laughs> either going open source with the same, the same group. The way to go. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, and then there was an IBM talk that I missed. Uh, yeah. What was that on? It was on. Um, it was on machine learning. Yeah. Oh, that would have been interesting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I missed it. I got to push again next year or next time for sure. <laughs> This is every two years, is it, or how often is it? I'm not sure. Yeah, cause this year was the very first one, right? This was the first RFG ever? Yes. I think so. Really? OK. Because I talked to someone telling me that they went before. But, uh, really? Maybe not in Vancouver. I got that impression, but totally. Me too. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, um, for today, I don't have anything too, too specific, but I think it's worth catching up on um, both RFG and then the Airborne EM conference. There's a lot that happened, at least on our end, at the Airborne EM conference. Um, and I even got a couple emails this morning that I would like to just share with everyone. Um, and then too, there's a few pull requests and things like that on the go that I think are worth chatting about, because it'd be nice to get those in, because a lot of the development that we did for the course that we just ran at the workshop um, sort of depends on those. So it'd be nice to actually be able to distribute them um, within the next week or so mm -hmm. and have it all running off of master. Because we don't want people trying to branch off, branch off and grab branches and things like that. Because that's confusing <laughs> if you don't actually understand how that works. Um, and then Joe, would you be willing to also give us like even a short update on um, what you've been up to in discretize? I've seen you making commits and so um, yeah, I can do a little bit. Just okay. a few quick things. That sounds good. Um, yeah, so do you want to maybe start with RFG? So, I mean, we talked briefly about it, but we had, you guys had each a presentation and Mike had a poster. Um, yeah, on my end, uh, two conversations. One was with uh, uh, a postdoc from, uh, oh, man, I can never remember him in the country. West Africa. Nigeria. 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 Yeah, I think I was really interested. So these was really interested, and obviously they, they want when they hear open source, they're, they're happy. And then the other one is uh, Craig's colleague, which was kind of like uh, not, uh, it was not organized, but it happened this way. He's a hydrogeologist and would like to use the tree meshes, uh, Joe. Uh, for a display to do a little bit like what video games do, you know, like when you zoom in, you you look at a different resolution, and when you zoom out, you look at a different resolution. So the tree mesh would be perfect for this, and uh, we're going to organize uh, a meeting, I guess, uh, next week with them. If Joe, you're, you would be it would be great if you can if you can sit in, in that meeting if you're if you're free. Yeah, I don't have anything really going on this summer, so. Is that just what I'm supposed to be doing? Yeah, that's great. So when it's confirmed, I'll uh, when we're starting to to organize it, I will uh, I'll CC you on the email, and then we can make sure that you're there. That's about it for oh. on my end. Yeah. And so he's thinking about that for visualization purposes, or he wants to simulate on it. From, from right now, I think it's just mostly for bills. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one project that we should do just a bit of digging on is Pangeo. They've done, um, I don't know if he's pulling maps and stuff like that or what he's up to. Uh, that's all I know. Yeah. Um, but Penji has done a really good job of basically figuring out how to pull large data sets. So it's like solving this problem of um, different resolutions. Um, so yeah, there might be some things there that would be useful as well. Yeah. So Penji was more on the database, database side? Yeah, database and um, 
Yeah, so they've done a lot of work on basically figuring out how to like, work with large data sets mm -hmm. and visualize them. Okay. So it could be a, a resource just out in our back pocket. That sounds good. Hopefully I have a couple things to say. Yeah. Yes? Your brother. It's like uh, on my end for my talk was, I, I got mostly questions and good feedback from Bill Morris at the University of McMaster. But in terms of more in depth conversation, I get, Mike and I, we talk a lot more with uh, uh, Ben Lee, which is a PhD student with Unsworth at the University of Alberta, and also one of his former student, uh, uh, Matthew Como. He did his PhD in, with uh, Unsworth, and now he's in uh, Manchester in, in Germany. And, yeah. And so he's, he presented actually two things in like, he pre like one project where they were acquiring empty data in Mongolia for uh, tectonic and uh, lithospheric studies. And uh, one of those projects where they were actually designing a new airborne system with uh, onboard uh, receivers, but ground sources. <coughs> and uh, I guess for it, it would just be a matter of time diving into SIMPEG, but he had a couple of common saying that yeah, for each project, PhD students co like write their own code that works for their specific case, and then it's just, they just redo the same job over and over, depending on like just like uh, like writing a new code for a specific project and so on. So yeah, and there were a lot of talk like uh, there were like two full session about I think like, like Wednesday was the most geophysics day, and most of the talk were. Uh, MT and uh, lithospheric studies. So, and most of them were using either 1D uh, inversions. Some were doing 2Ds, but I don't think I've ever even seen a 3D inversion anywhere in the presentation. And I think that might like MT might be something that would really help simple, uh, really help advertise simply because it seems that a lot of people are doing MT, but they might not have the Computational tool to uh, push the data up to the, the up to the limit. Did Matthew uh, seem like he was interested in getting involved, or was it just sort of more like a question of that's cool? Or no, I mean he was definitely asking like kind of capabilities we had and acted like he'd be interested in playing around with it, seeing okay. if he could use it. So we just kind of told him that Goodney was kind of the one who had spearheaded most of the natural source stuff. Okay. And he was gonna. He acted like he was gonna think about getting in touch. He was gonna be headed up to the field fairly. Soon. Yeah, he's spending. He's spending like a, a month. month in, in, so yeah. So I don't know if that'll happen months. super soon, but. Okay. And that's really good. Yeah, that's good. His model was. His was. Yeah. He did show both one. Okay. Yeah. Right. People ask for asking questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is this there, not there? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. that's true. He's doing so, yeah. yeah, I mean, because I know him pretty well from undergrad, too. Okay. Um, so, if you'd be happy to send a follow up email, even just like sending him Slack and all those kinds of things. Yeah. 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 So that's at least an entry point. So. Yeah, no, he definitely seemed interested. So. And Ben, I think that Sogi knows him well also and good so he's already. But he's taking that up. He doesn't want to do it by once. Well, the day he doesn't have a license anymore, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Beyond those interactions with those guys, I didn't really have too many other really. I mean, there were a few people who stopped by that I talked through the poster with, but most of them were didn't really have much background in geophysics at all. They were just like general interest. So yeah. Uh, one thing that might be worth doing. So we just started a geoside blog organization. Um, so we want to have just a place to like talk short thing about the workshop that we gave at uh, 8 p.m. Um, would you guys be willing to even just write, like, just each a quick paragraph on what you talked about and then write a couple highlights on the conference? 
So it'd be nice to like, just have a place to show what you did and then have kind of a link to your presentation or to your, like, if you book copy your proposal or whatever. Yeah. And then it's still yeah. wrapped. Um, okay. Any other general thoughts on RG? Um, all right, well, then I guess we can move on to the everybody am. Uh, so, yeah, so that was a um, busy week we had. Uh, we gave a half day workshop on the Sunday. And the day before that, we attended the Argus. Well, Doug and I attended the Argus workshop, and Saudi so attended one on uh, groundwater and modeling. Um, it was on. It was mostly targeted at a software package called GeoC uh, 3D. There, it seems to. They're making a bit of a push for visualization and um, like constructing models and things like that. It, they, it sort of comes across as they're trying to position themselves as like. A Patrel or one of these kinds of packages, but for groundwater. Um, so it's not necessarily, I don't think it's open source, um, but there's lots of talk about that. Um, yeah, then when we went to the Argus um, workshop, which was really interesting because their code is definitely pretty widely used, especially for SkyTem conversions. It's all 1D. Um, and it was interesting just like getting a feel for how they formulate the inverse problem and what they feel is important. They spend a lot of energy um, like accurately um, modeling the system. Um, so making sure that you're getting the waveform really accurate, um, you're getting the receiver responses and all of that included in your simulation. Um, and the way that they formulate the inverse problem though is a bit different than how we do. Which was really interesting to see. I sort of thought everybody did the same thing we did, <laughs> which is not the case. So, did you? I guess we'll email Espen and see if we can yeah, get a copy. I'm proposing that now. Okay, so let's get that out today. Yeah, because it'd be I'm just like interesting to circulate, and you guys can take a look too. Yeah, and then for our workshop, we had about thirty people. Yeah, which is pretty good. There were like 150 at the whole conference, so. Yeah, this was this preceded the conference. Uh, the Arhos group had about thirty, I think, two. So yeah, we had about thirty. So that was good. It's twenty percent of the conference. Yeah, I'm mad. <laughs> well, and people were interested. I mean, they were. Yeah, there, there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm for it, and a lot of positive feedback afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly between that and the conference as, as a whole, uh, there was a lot of talk about Simpay. I mean, you could just hear that word. On the okay, that's good. What's the breakdown roughly? There's a lot of companies, geological surveys, universities. Well, there was a big group from Australia with like Geoscience Australia and CSIRO. Uh, and CSIRO. Um, yeah, I think there's, hmm, I don't know, maybe most, maybe mostly academics and universities and government agencies, but there were certainly other people there, especially people connected with, and SkyTem was there, so there's the, there's the industry component right there. Uh, and then there were other people who were involved in data acquisition or processing of the data getting more towards end users. So um, yeah, actually it was pretty nice. It was a pretty nice cross section and a lot of a uh, lot of opportunity for you know different conversations. The uh, the major project that is in development at this point, driven by a guy by the name of uh, Ken Lowry uh, from Australia, uh, is something called Watershed. So they're they're actively looking for putting together a, a large group of very diverse people that would take everything from data acquisition all the way through to groundwater hydrology parameters and providing information that you know, farmers could make some assessment on you know where to drill or, or, or not. 
And Australia is under extreme duress with respect to their water. And so they're, now they're just looking for, okay, other places in the continent to, wh where should we start thinking about agriculture? Just places that haven't really been used that much for, for agriculture. And that, of course, means they need to find water. They need to know how much water resources they have. So they're flying airborne EM, uh, their Tempest system, VTEM, some, some Sky Temp, I think, too, yeah, uh, over, they're going to, they want to do basically all of Australia. Yeah. So that's a huge, huge project. And uh, Ken is you know, trying to put together kind of all the stakeholders and try to get a global vision to really not only uh, look at Australia's problem, but look to see how you could develop technology that would be used around the world. So get into the African countries and all of the other places. So uh, that's a big project, and certainly I think you're going to see water as the dominant issue over the next 10, 10 years. So any aspect of geophysics that's really pertinent to, to water issues is, is going to be. Which, which was surprising, I heard GZ had like a chapter water for, and it was super small, maybe the smaller stuff for. I was I wanted to be surprised at that. One of their two big main public talks in the evening, though, was on the, the water crisis. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just a good talk. The, was that recorded, do you know? I'm sure it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you had cameras up in the back. Right? Maybe you can yeah. find the link, send it. Interesting. Yeah. There's a guy who, was working, who had done some work with NASA and JPL and was moving up to some newly founded organization in Saskatchewan that was all about water. Like developing new policies related to water use. Yeah, if you could find that, yeah. that would be really interesting. I'll go through things again. I'm sure I can find it. And Rosemary was there, Rosemary Knight from, from Stanford, and she's got a big initiative from the California aspect of trying to you know, get a complete workflow for groundwater hydrology so that uh, kind of bring together whatever information you have from geologic logs to well logs to any kind of observations to uh, having airborne EM inverted, integrated, and taking things through down to hydraulic connectivity and modeling and just, again, a complete workflow of really addressing the whole water issue within California. Yeah, and there's certain states like Nebraska I was really impressed with, with how much they have done. And, and their stuff is all available, like they have water or a lot of data that is associated with work that they've done. But they actually, I think, have been working more cohesively as a, as a group than I think California has. It's, you know, Nebraska really seems to kind of have it together. That was my, my impression. <coughs> well, they're all sitting on top of one giant aquifer together. Just that part of the country, that's kind of the, it's probably a very similar culture to what you have around Edmonton, right? All the farming communities and stuff like that, the people are just very willing to together and work with their own a communal benefit. Yeah, don't think that's true in California from what no. I hear. No. <laughs> no. It's kind of like every man for himself. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but some of the numbers on the on the water issue were really really pretty staggering as far as you know the percentage of countries that are in distress situation now. And you know the projections that I think was it between 2035 and 2050 that basically you know, this planet is going to be running out of water. And there's places in the uh, in the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, that you know they're pumping so much water up, stuff, everything is subsiding, and the rate of subsidence is huge. Man, it's like 20 centimeters per year, and it's been doing that for many years, so it's down, that was like 9 meters or something, or 19 meters? I think it's 17 meters. 17 meters? meters past like 50 years. years. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that stuff is irrecoverable, yeah. right? You can't just pump 
water and grow <laughs> 17 years again. Nope. Yeah, the same thing's happening in India. They can measure it with INSAR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's exactly the point. You, you know, we are continually to deplete you know, our water supplies, but it's irreversible in any of the occasions. So something drastic is, A, going to happen, and something actually needs to be done to kind of curve this as quickly as possible, which is why I think you're going to see water as being the dominant issue. And in the East, they had several issues in Quebec where like, they were pumping water, but they were like, close to the, to the ocean. And, they, and so basically, the salt water was replacing the, the fresh water that was pumped. Okay. But then, then this interface is kind of fixed. So the more you pump, the, the, the smaller your fresh water reservoir is. So they were trying to monitor that with the fix time, time domain and system to try to okay. monitor yeah. to where the interface was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that was really exciting about um, like Ken's vision is he is very excited about open source, very excited about like they're already using Jupyter. They're sort of already aware of the open source ecosystem. I don't think they're necessarily as like experienced as we are with like managing an open source project and things like that. So I think we actually we have a lot to offer them, um, both in terms of like software, like Simpeg, but also in terms of like the infrastructure and figuring out how to function and all of that. Um, so that's exciting. He'll be keeping in touch with us. What's his last name, Ken? Ken Lowry, L-A-W-R-I-E. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's some other exciting things to share. Um, so Geoscience Australia has a big open source push. And so actually a lot of their, most of their codes are open source. And they've got a ton of data uh, that's uh, openly available. They, I mean, they're working on flying like the entire country with their one yeah. um, They've already done large spots, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so we actually have an email this morning from uh, Houston Lake Cooper, who is at Geoscience Australia. And he's been the guy who's um, doing a big push on a lot of these like really large airborne surveys. Uh, and he's extremely interested in contributing to EMGSI and to SIMPEG, and so getting Geoscience Australia on board. Okay. Um, What's their code that they're providing open source? What are they? What are they uh, if you go, like, it, it's basically all of their software. So they've got their 1D inversions. Um, so I'll put this link. On. That's all the uh, rocks broken codes. Yeah. He worked for Malcolm Sandwich. He did, he did some really nice 1D inversions of where he actually incorporated a lot of the other survey parameters, like pitch roll job, plane, altitude. Okay. Um, so, here, uh, so there's a Geoscience Australia GitHub organization. Um, and you can have a look and see all of their codes. So their EM, um, I believe it was just eight EM. I've got it written down. So if you're interested in checking it out, um, yeah, but they've got something like whoops, seven hundred and sixty-four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like they've got a ton of stuff that's open and available, and so that's exciting. Um, because there's potentially reasons to compare, and especially if we get Houston on board, and we can actually start figuring out like how, mm -hmm. how things operate. Um, that's uh, USGS. So um, there were three people there from the USGS: Berkmansley, or at least three that we are chatting with: uh, Berkmansley, Paul Proposing, and Lindsay Ball. And they're each working on very interesting data sets. Um, so there might be some pretty strong connections there. Um, one of the connections that I think is fairly immediate, which is really exciting, is he's going to be releasing uh, his MCMC code um, on GitHub, and that'll be open source. And he, they're looking for different forward simulators to plug in. So they've got one code that they're using for airborne um, surveys, but are now looking to actually include something for a ground-based loop. Um, and I guess their code is isn't quite well suited for that. I think it's a larger loop, I and mean, they might only have five resources. Um, yeah, so that is actually like a very immediate connection that we can make. And so 
like it would be great to first of all, I mean, we can make sure that Simpay plugs into something else fairly seamlessly, hopefully, <laughs> um, which I think is, is doable. And then also from his end to make sure that you know he can access actually a variety of forward modelers um, would be really beneficial. So that's something that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and those data sets also that Lindsay was just talking about uh, are really interesting IP data sets, some of them with two zero crossing, some with three, some with four, <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of interesting stuff going on. I, another one of the connections that I think will happen, and we need to follow up on that, is really a, a much closer connection with the Arhus group. Uh, they're developing 3D modeling, so that would mean that there's opportunity for them to, you know, find out, do validation with what they're doing and what's being done in the Simpic codes, and perhaps even to do some of the codes. Uh, where uh, other points of contact there are, are simply comparing the inverse problem, because as Lindsay said, it's 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 sort of same same but different. Like they've got sort of an extra Marquardt Levenberg term in the uh, Hessian matrix. And that's actually very important to them. They're somehow using that uh, kind of as we use a beta cooling. It's not it's not clear. I mean there's there's a lot of things that are you know kind of the same, but as we know within version, details can make a huge difference. So I think if we could connect with them on that. Okay. And also, what well, about Tui? You remember him? Uh, yeah. yeah. So he's uh, he, he's basically finished up suffering physically because he hurt his shoulder. So he's been a little bit out of mission, but he has published a paper in which he's got a semi-analytic solution for a plane beneath a variable overburden, and they'd like to, yeah. It, there is reason for them to kind of check that against you know, a different kind of code, so I think that's another potential intervention. Are you saying uh, that here while well, they're working on 3D? 3D yeah, they yeah. very much like to do 3D. Well, they, they've hired, they've got some people time. Okay. 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 So um, it's in their okay. it's a... But it's, it's unclear whether the framework in which they're doing the inversion at this point is going to stall when you actually kind of extend it to 3D. I think most of their, well, it, for most of their codes, they find the full Jacobian matrix, and they do that with finite difference to subtraction, and then they're actually solving that full system in the universe. So that's, all of those might potentially work pretty nicely at a 1D or maybe even 2D level, scale that up and you might have some challenges. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I think the good news is that there was there was a lot of visibility. Lindsay's talk went really well, so did Soggy's. Well, so then uh, yeah, so I mean people people were taking note and they were starting to realize like, oh, it, it is true, unless I adopt some open source framework and kind of work together in the community, I'm just not going to be able to keep up. And these watershed problems or any of these that are so multidisciplinary, you've got so many different groups that need to communicate, share information, uh, they, they can't be solved anywhere, anyhow else, except from some kind of community. Mm -hmm. So I think all of that, uh, you know, bodes very well, and uh, yeah, even Espen Hawken, who was the sort of organizer of this, is definitely not a Simpeg open source fan, <laughs> but you know, he's he, he's kind of come around, and he was saying some few nice things about working, you know, at least trying trying to get some collaboration going. So you know, there's also oh, is he so against it? Oh, he just doesn't need it. I don't think he's against it. I think, well, sorry. Um, oh, but I think they, they basically got a, a structure that kind of works, works for, works for them. So it's, 
it's, it's kind of like a well-oiled machine. It's got an inversion engine at part, and he's already hooked up quite a few things. So they do have some sort of a modular system, and anybody else who comes on, you know, needs to kind of fit in, into that. And uh, yeah, so at this point, he doesn't really see any need for really adopting an open source model. But Anders was quite keen to do some comparisons and things like that with, with us. So that's at least a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. Right, so he was he was keen, and then there's also this uh, project that they've got, which is again a workflow for uh, geophysics, hydrogeology, kind of same thing that I was talking about with California system, uh, and that that is done in Python, and they want to make that open source. So there's there's stuff that's just being developed now that I think there's some reason that. You know, might interact quite nicely with them, but the things that part of what they're doing with the Argos workbench, uh, you know, it's it, first of all, it's a well oiled machine, I think, and secondly, uh, they'd be very protective of a lot of the intellectual property that's associated with that because they, they, they make it their own, which I can fully really understand. I wanted to pick up though on um, what you're saying about the, the talks and like, because I think there were a number of people who were quite keen on Simpic and I had a really good chat with Sean Walker when we were on, um, well on the Wednesday I guess, there was an, or Tuesday, one of the days, there was an excursion and um, Doug and I were on a sailboat and um, Sean Walker was there. It was a sailboat and there were like 30 or so people on this one. So we just spend the afternoon hanging on a boat. Uh, so I had a really good chat with him, and then he sent me an email this morning because um, he got the, the notice that we were having a meeting. He said he couldn't join, but he wanted to share some of his thoughts. Um, so I wanted to read this to you guys. Um, so what he has said is the thing that came to mind uh, was something. Sorry. I'll... So. I won't be able to attend the meeting, um, but thought that I would provide some comments from conversations I had with various people about Python, Simpeg, and open source at the AEM conference. I mentioned a lot of it to you on the boat trip, um, but have done some more thinking since. Feel free to pass this on to the group. You said, uh, the thing that came to mind was something about my, uh, something my daughter has been learning about in primary school uh, the past few years. The idea of having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. I feel that many people within our industry, right, and when I say that I when I say that I mean mineral exploration and geophysics, uh, have a fixed mindset. We like things the way they are and don't like to change. I feel this Doug's talk at the AEM 2018 conference uh, summed up many reasons why we have come to a point where we need to make a change. I really like that he even mentioned that he used to be against open source. Um, but has come around to the idea of working as a community. Sadly, when I would ask for people's opinions in real time or tell them why I was excited about the prospect of using SimPeg for various things, it appeared that the message had fallen on deaf ears. I heard a lot of Python, hmm, I don't know, uh, which I take to mean, I don't know uh, what that is, and I don't want to make the effort to learn something new. Uh, Simpic, is so that really good. available for free? <laughs> uh, the good news is that people who are into it are all in. The presentation by Burke Minsley uh, from the USGS at AEM 2018 about his Python practice was great. Uh, Ian McLeod from Geosoft is a huge proponent of open source and are actively developing Python packages to access most of it, if not all, of the core Geosoft functionality, a lot of which can be uh, run with only the Google installed. I know Sid Visser has been an advocate of open source everything for years. I showed one of the Python notebooks to a geophysicist friend and he thought it was amazing. He said, how do I get that? The problem is, is the answer has many steps. I know that there are ways to make it easier. Unfortunately, uh, what many people are used to is getting just the end product, a static web app or an executable. I think that it'll take a while for people to understand that with the Jupyter Notebook and Python, they can have that and all of the tools to remake that final product into exactly what they want. Uh, that's all for now. 
perhaps a goal would be to have a one-day Python slash open geophysics workshop slash symposium slash unconference at some point. A bunch of talks showing all of the great stuff that can be done with these tools. The annual BCGS Fall Symposium in 2019 might be a good thing. It will give people outside of UBC, um, talking mainly about himself, a chance to catch up and have a bit of material. So, that's great. That's, that's, that's great. great. Yeah. He probed the uh, he probed the uh, the people yeah, yeah. from the outside. That's perfect. That's also a good suggestion about 2019. Yeah, BCGS. Just yeah, even straight up Python, just like 101 and like half a day. <laughs> the teacher yeah. basic Python. I like it. I'm gonna pick it up right then. Yeah. So that's great, great idea. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Well, Sean was really taken by the potential for him just to do, redo his master's project really? in SIMPEG because there he was solving for survey parameters as well as uh, you know, connectivity from either ground sources or airborne oh, okay. sources, right? And uh, oh, yeah. you know that. That functionality would be so straightforward to implement within within Simpe. Oh well, maybe I could come back to it and actually publish that paper that we're <laughs> supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a oh, that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, I thought like I had a great conversation with him. Um, he's a huge advocate for us, and um, I think he's going to be a great Continue to be a big advocate. Hmm. Yeah, I see it as a generational, as a generational thing. You know, like our industry is slow to pick up, but I don't know if we can get the the newer ones coming in, change the way things are done. It's going to be hard to change the old, the old, uh, old guard. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if we keep forward doing some interesting things and make some noise. Let's not stop because of that. Um, any other questions about the conference or do you have any other comments about the page? No, other than the fact that I just felt that there was starting to get to be a, a lot of substantial traction here with respect to SIMPEG and open source. I mean, there's just, you know, a lot of things that are kind of coming in together with a lot of, with different groups out there that are kind of adopting an, an open source model. And uh, yeah, as I said, the word SIMPEG, you could hear it through virtually every coffee conversation. Somebody would be coffee. So that's good. You know, it, that's the first thing, get on the radar screen. Yeah. And you know, then the second thing is to have you know, some things out there that people could benefit from easily. Realize like, oh, I can use this program to check some numbers, or I can use this to simulate, or whatever. As, as, as soon as you have that, then there's like, oh, that is I that was a good Sean, Sean's great comment too, right? <laughs> is the whole the upfront hurdle of the end to get through it? That's kind of like we're dropping a lot of people because of it. But, but I don't know the solution in this case. <laughs> if we make it too easy, then or like it's very restrictive. But, yeah. yeah, but there's definitely some progress we can make there too. More easily install it. We get there. Well, our examples are good too. I mean that. For us, that was sort of the window into getting people to use it, right? What is the, it? The examples on the oh, SIMPED yeah. website yeah, that's right. to see how to do that stuff. And then if they want to see how it works, they, they have everything, but being able to get them to use it first. Yeah. That's true. And on that note, I mean, if there's, we have um, a little bit of time and want to do something that is a big contribution, but it's not actually too big of overhead, is refactoring the examples so they are sort of that notebook style. Mm -hmm. Example, I think, just yeah. makes it so much friendlier. Because then you're not looking at a wall of code, you're looking at like these six lines do this thing. Um, yeah. And so, 
and like it, it's just rearranging comments. That's all. Like that's all that overhead is. So, and we can get those PRs in fast if that's something that you guys are. Are we going to Sure. Yeah, I mean, if everybody does five of them, we're done. So. Um, Joe, would you begin to give us a quick update from your end on where things are at with discretized? Yeah, I can do that really quick. Um, mostly I've just been implementing little things here and there. Uh, I believe it's almost, it should be complete with what was previously implemented now with the plot slice functions and everything in there. Um, they could use a little bit of refinement to make like for the streamlined plots that tensor mesh can support. Um, but that shouldn't be too much more work considering I can just do it on the, we can do it on the quad tree side of it easily enough. Um, other than that, it's just, I, I tried to get all the support in there I could for different size meshes at least for now. I don't think it's been tested that much yet. It works great. Right. Uh, Craig is running with the uh, with the different dimensions, and it's it works great. Right? Okay, so that's good then. <laughs> uh, I definitely should probably build, uh, write up a few more test scripts to test everything in it to make sure it keeps working, because um, there is definitely a lot of stuff that I added in that has not been that is not tested, like through the test scripts yet. But that'll be something to add in. We can do that at some other point. Um, and then the other thing is, like I said, there's still probably a decent amount of unsafe operations that could happen that we would like to guard against in the implementation once it's finalized and everything. But again, we can iterate on that and just encourage people not to do those things <laughs> in the meantime. Yeah. So. Well, it's easier to catch the important ones when you throw it out in the wild and we'll see what breaks. <laughs> <laughs> How do we want to? So uh, Joe was saying, well, we need a PR on the simplex size to uh, catch up right, with, with the changes. Um, right. So which one, how, what's the order of operation that we want to do this? Okay, so I think what we should do, because there's, there's a couple things that are like, like that right now. So there's the 3D cell mesh, and then there's a um, change on uh, simplex that needs to accompany that. So I would like to get those in um, this week. And then I think, like... Let's get the discretized one in first, and then we'll try and get the simpeg one in like same day. Um, if because what needs to be done on the, the simpeg side? Um, there's just a few of the examples that might need to be changed around. A few of the uh, um, stuff that Dom had worked on for the regularization options, or regularization building uh, things need to be updated in the simpeg side. Um, there's a few things that I can update in the DC stuff as far as like moving around uh, or the location that match up with the top of meshes. Uh, topography stuff can be updated. This, it's just things off the top of my head. I'm sure that stuff will pop up if we start running tests on Simpeg against discretize or up against that pull request and catch him. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, if we get, so let's get the 3D cell stuff in, because that is like self consistent, and then we'll get the tree mesh stuff in discretize, and we can start a PR on Simpeg. And if people want to continue using the old tree mesh, we'll just make sure that they're on older discretize, and that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be a problem. I don't know why you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so much better. It's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's just keep, we'll push all of the things forward as much as we can. Sounds good. Excellent. Any other things you guys want to go over today or questions, comments? Uh, I'll just make one comment. Uh, that had to do with this email we got from Phoenix Geophysics. Uh, I forwarded it to you. Yeah, you yeah, see no, it? No, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway. It sounds like they've got sort of standalone you know, portable instruments that just simply record time series continuously. So they've got one in Hawaii, for instance, where it's been operating for 
couple of months now. They've, they're deploying these in various places. Um, the thing that makes this interesting, I think, is that they're making all this data available. They are also processing the data with their algorithms, right, to get out uh, impedances and tippers. And, you know, they're kind of inviting people to, you know, go ahead, use, uh, use the data, uh, use your own processing codes, if you like. You could compare with what they're doing and just kind of be really open about it. So as we, I think, progress with the MT, and that has to do with, then with all the processing stuff, John. I yeah, that'd be, I got to get into that pretty quick here in a couple months, for sure. Yeah. Do you know about that? Uh, were you aware of that email? No, actually, I did not know about this. This is I'll, interesting. I'll, I'll forward that to you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, I think it might be an opportunity just to you know, actually have available data and yeah. what we consider to be professional state-of-the-art processing done from one of, one of the companies and just be, uh, yeah, see how we could advance that whole aspect of our MT. That would be great. I'll send you that. Did they say it's available already or? I believe so, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll have to check that. <laughs> All right. Well, if that's everything, thanks everyone. Um, and if you guys have ideas for what you want to talk about next week, just ping on Slack and we'll get something yeah. organized. Beautiful. Done. Have a good, good day. Thanks for joining. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.